good evening to one and all uh, i rituprya gutu assistant professor welcome you all to the 6th day of the national security development program on expected nuances in law post covid 19 uh, for today's session we are very grateful to have amongst us dr shashi kala gurpur ma'am dr gurpur ma'am is the director of symbiosis law school pune she is also the dean at the faculty of law uh uh symbiosis international to her credit she has been conferred with several awards for her contribution to professional community she is known to be a community leader in improving quality of higher education and has worked extensively through various forum to bring a change among the disadvantaged group of society her commitment her commitment to the empowerment of the disadvantaged has been recognized by the state government of karnataka she is the recipient of the prestigious kitur chennamma award 2019 from the ministry of women and child development government of karnataka we welcome you ma'am and apologies for the inconvenience <laughs> no, no, that has caused it's my apology also no 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 ma'am <laughs> we'll surely take care next time yeah yeah Over i am this ma'am we are like a family because all law fraternity all over the world are one family so there is no such thing as uh, taking offense oh, it's no, no, uh, no. not in our control like covid you know it is something that none of us choose to do uh, so, so it is such a pleasure to see such uh, energetic vibrant people like rituprya who has taken the initiative and saili ma'am who has written to me and now the gentleman nakul who was talking to me uh, it's so uh, energizing to see all of you uh, bright faces and the young law professors so i hope the audience is uh, all law professors or are there non law professors also who are trying to connect their discipline to law or have an extra understanding of law uh, ma'am we are joined by uh, law professors uh, mostly uh -huh. And from are, all over the country, yes, fifty yes. fifty eight participants we are seeing are from all over the country. Yes, ma'am. So yes. I'm I'm just curious to know how many of you are actively teaching international law. Uh, ma'am, we can uh, see it from the hand raises. Actually, they have the attendee attendee status because of which they cannot speak because if all the mics are open, then there's a lot of disturbance. But so they can't I'm, write the chat box. May they can't. Yeah, speak. they can. They can write. Uh, I request all the participants to uh, raise hands. to answer ma'am's question yeah uh, they can uh, write in the chat box that's allowed right yeah so uh, ma'am they can yeah. yeah so i am very curious to know how many of you are international law teachers active international law teachers means teaching some or other area of international law what could that be you will agree with me yes there is one uh, uh, lady who has told she is teaching international law uh, see uh, ujjwala ma'am is there we know ujjwala ma'am she is a very good uh, teacher of international law some of you may not be directly teaching international law you may be teaching a, a close area between international relations and international law some of you may be teaching uh, international trade law uh aerospace law as a kind of elective course or you may be teaching something like environmental law uh today it would be wrong to say that only a uh, hardcore international law teacher is to know the international law because in every subject uh, we are seeing we call in law subject we don't call it courses in the legal education so in every subject we have first to five units or three units as you all are law teachers i can use that language are reserved for knowing the global position comparative position or international framework so for all of us the knowledge of international law is mandatory and some of you who are pursuing phd or planning to pursue phd would bail me out that you have to dedicate one chapter or a few chapters or even development of yeah somebody is dealing with commercial arbitration so it's international trade law related business law um, area so you are you are seeing that there is a very close uh, kind of nexus between municipal law or national law and international law therefore international law assumes a kind of indispensable uh, position within any discipline of law like you know once upon a time we used to study uh, ipr ipr as a subject was introduced very recently in last let us say 
10, uh, 20 years because of the uh, post uh, WTO and also globalization, liberalization dimension. Earlier, Indians uh, used to have very few patents and they would go abroad or register abroad the patents. Patent law practice also was very limited, etc. Today, if you are looking at uh, IP law, it's essentially having its ramifications drawn from international law or international developments. Similarly, you would think that something like personal law, so-called personal law or family law would be very national in uh, character, but uh, you would be surprised to know that large percentage of Indians migrating, today family law is seen as a migrating families law. So uh, there is a lot of international implication in all of this. So uh, coming to the fundamentals of international law, uh, I request the organizers to run my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, are you able to share it? If you are not able to share it, I will share my presentation. Uh, Ma'am, I have it. Uh, I have the presentation with me. It's up okay, to will you start, Nakul? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ma Please. So uh, I am starting the presentation. Uh, before my name or name of the topic, I'm starting it with the map. Uh, if you see that it could be a little bit magnified, I think, because they may be viewing it from far. Uh, so what do you see in the map? Uh, you see all the countries of the world depicted with certain colors. Now, this was the situation on the 20th of March, 2020, not long ago. How many months ago? Almost uh, four months ago. It looks like it was in last century because the because it is always like that. An experience which is imposed uh, makes you uh, feel the time is shrinking because you you don't want to remember that uh, time which has thrown you off balance. So on the 20th of March, this is how the world looked. So here we have different color codes. If all the audience can see there, you have uh, countries which are colored with gray. How many are there? You can barely see about one, two, three, four, five, six out of how many? 192 countries. Now, these uh, uh, gray countries are the countries which did not take any measure as far as international travel restriction was concerned. And then you have the light pink uh, kind of country. Uh, a few are there, which includes China, which introduced uh, screening. A few countries in Africa, some in uh, Southern America, uh, including Brazil. So from the way the coloring is, you can imagine the kind of COVID response these countries gave. So they have light pink zone. And then you come uh, to the, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. So yellow are the countries which have the screening. Light pink are the countries which say that people who come from high risk reason, regions should be screened. So they, uh, and they must be quarantined. And then there are countries like India and others which are in a slightly reddish pink kind of uh, zone, which have Australia also, which have levied a ban on high risk region travelers. Then there are dark red countries. In the dark red, you will see the uh, French, the Germans, you will see uh, on this side, you will see United uh, I mean, you see Canada. See, United States of America is in the ban on high risk regions by 20th of March, whereas Canada has already closed borders. The dark red, hello? Hello? Yeah, so the dark red, can you see the dark red uh, regions? Dark red regions are the ones who by, on, by 20th of March itself had closed their borders totally. Just think about it. There are countries uh, which are seen allowing passengers on the 20th of March to come in and to go out but then there are countries which have sealed the borders. But if you go by 20th March, if you can recall your experience, which countries ought to have sealed by then? And which countries ought to have allowed quarantining and uh, uh, ban on high-risk regions? Which ought to have been the country which should have uh, not allowed anyone to come in or go out? By 20th of March, we had the country from where it had originated coming into the zone, which is in the, uh, which is not allowing high risk people inside, which is China. 
So why is such a response by the states? And how did this response get determined? And when states are behaving this way, what kind of norms are behind this behavior in the COVID-19 situation? So these are some of the questions that we are going to discuss in the light of our understanding of international law. Slide. So the next slide is going to tell you who I am. I, I have already been introduced and uh, uh, the theme is COVID-19 and international law. We are going to look at the issues from the international point of view, law point of view, challenges and what are the lessons that we have learned. I have given my uh, reference materials among the many that I referred at the end and I have also circulated the important regulation of WHO. Can any one of you tell me which is that regulation? That regulation was first passed in the 60s and it got amended in, the two, in 2005. After 2005, this regulation has not been amended and this is the first global pandemic which is being dealt with by this norm which is under WHO. Now, first let us gather our understanding of international law. If you're trying to see, let us say, if you're trying to measure this television screen, you have to have some basis on which you're measuring. You may say that it is so much of, uh, so many inches in width, so many inches in breadth. That means some parameter you have to use, right? So if we are using a parameter to understand the COVID-19 uh, from the international law point of view, first we have to recall our uh, understanding of international law quickly. So next slide, please. That's what I am trying to do. And in the COVID context, the most important international organization is a kind of uh, uh, specialized agency of United Nations Organization, which is WHO. United Nations Organization, as we all know, is a kind of little, uh, I won't use the word primitive, it's a kind of, uh, a, uh, a kind of uh, um, um, little obscure kind of government at the global level, if we may say. Because today, if you argue, United Nations Organization has got all the sovereign nations of the world as its member. Their members, uh, member state or member nation. Therefore, membership of United Nations Organization would mean membership of uh, world community and it would uh, in a way be governed by the norms of United Nations Organization. Although not by external force, but by internal observance. So this is the understanding. So WHO being a specialized agency of United Nations organization will be at the global level regulating certain dimensions of health. Uh, and therefore, any epidemic that has an outbreak which escapes beyond the national borders to become the pandemic. So the epidemic, a zoonotic kind of a epidemic which evolved out of China uh, escapes the borders and becomes a pandemic. So when such a, a proportion has been assumed by a disease, then it is WHO which comes to act in order to see that there is a common minimum understanding and commonality and coordination between different sovereign states at the international level. So what is the understanding of international law? Secondly, there's a very important norm. What do we mean by norm? I don't use the word law. I don't use the, I, why don't I use the word rule? It is a rule, it is a law, but not rule and law in the sense in which we will be using the word law in terms of having a force to be, uh, uh, force to be taken to be backed by sanction. Why and how we will discuss the chronology of uh, COVID-19. So international uh, health regulation is the one which we are going to discuss here as a norm. Some kind of, a, of an insipid, insipid norm which is there uh, reckonable in the global level, uh, somewhat relating to preventing, protecting, providing during a pandemic. So these are the uh, initial understandings that we have to have before we go into the analysis of the situation. Now, first of all, international law. How does international law uh, work or function? We all know that international law regulates international relations and transactions and interactions. So these interactions are at inter international level. So when we say international level, why do we say this? 
it is Tark who evolved this definition because if you see international law deals with interaction between states, then there are relations which are uh, covered by international law in actual practice, which involve non-state actors as well, non-state actors like United Nations organization. On the other hand, if you see international law deals with international institutions and international states, uh, I mean, uh, and states at the international level, then we also have individuals who are covered by international law, whose uh, injury has been repaired when they were doing some work on the UN mission, or somebody like Kulbushan Zadov has been the subject matter of uh, appeal in the, inter or rather, uh, subject matter of uh, plea before the International Court of Justice. So international law, therefore, is not just restricted to nations, it's not just restricted to organizations. It's something that governs interaction and transactions at international level, irrespective of individuals, states, organizations, private actors as well. So uh, therefore, a subject of law, who is a subject of law? An entity who in law is governed by rights, responsibilities, liabilities. So such subjects in international law include individuals, institutions and states. We also know that international law can be uh, found, means uh, the basis and the sources from where we understand international law, take international law norms or rules, are customary practices between states, treaties which are signed by states, and the general principles which are nowadays developed through UNO bodies such as International Court of Justice or General Assembly resolutions or Security Council resolutions. So we have also the dimension in international law of its relationship with the municipal law, which means how does international rule um, influence the municipal law or how a particular country's municipal practice evolves into international law. We know that customary practices initially evolved out of the practices of the, they say even now they accuse international law of being West centric or Eurocentric because most of the norms evolved out of the customary practices of these states from the world. However, we also have certain practices which are very similar to the practices which were there in the societies which were on the eastern side. Therefore, uh, it is about finding a common denominator of law across various legal systems and communities. So relationship with municipal law happens in terms of influencing the municipal law or the vice versa. Adopting international law principle into municipal law by means of court judgments or enactments or adoption through an enactment or it could also be transforming the existing norm to match with the international law. So this is how it has been happening. Sometimes they say that both international and municipal law are inseparable. Sometimes they say they both are separable. Sometimes they say it becomes adopted or it becomes uh, transformed. So this is how we see international law. Now international law also governs our common uh, endowments or resources. What is the common resource which is not divided like how states are divided, which are divided like the territories with boundaries. There are resources like air, space, sea. Then we also have uh, resources like environment. Within environment, we have water as a resource. We have air as a resource. We have gaseous uh, resources. So these resources are uh, com sometimes commonly enjoyed between states. Therefore, international law governs these resources as well and these spaces as well. So if we are connecting this to the COVID situation, we have had international law uh, governing law of the sea taking a kind of uh, taking a kind of response when the cruise ships were not allowed to ports. Can you recall in Italy when the cases were increasing, in Spain when the cases were increasing, the cruise ships. Cruise ships are not at fault because cruise ships are usually ships which are uh, commissioned for recreational purposes or specific uh, mercantile or other travels. They were denied entry. Now similar denial of entry practice came uh, in the Spanish flu outbreak and uh, even in New York, uh, New York uh, flu outbreak. Because in the flu outbreak, when the flu was spreading from territory to territory, they suddenly realized that this was happening because of the uh, ship which was uh, 
moving from one post to another and the contagious nature of the disease with the touch of the sailors, people entering the ship, coming out of the ship and the ship uh, coming to the shore and then the mercantile uh, uh, or the crew entering the land and then eating in restaurants or meeting with the community, mixing with the community, watching dance parties and then going back to the ship and the ship going and landing, uh, shoring in another uh, uh, bank, uh, causing the disease. So this is how they found a nexus between ship and uh, outbreak of the pandemic during the Spanish flu. Therefore, they had learned a lesson. Therefore, immediately they blocked uh, these uh, uh, cruise ships from entering the port. So this was governed by law of the sea, uh, the mercantile law as well, the maritime law. Uh, then there was the issue of transport, freedom of transport, contract of transport, which was coming under attack because the goods which were supposed to be coming from one country's port to another country were suddenly required to be uh, diverted. Uh, sometimes post also has been used. I don't know how many of you have read about it. I'm coming to that. Then we had the issue of uh, trade law. Uh, issue of trade law in the sense that uh, we had uh, uh, the, the trade to be carried on, especially in essential goods. Essential goods which became more essential due to the uh, outbreak of uh, COVID-19. Which one was that? Uh, we needed medicines. We needed essential food. Uh, we also needed equipments, so this was the thing. And then we had the issue of intellectual property rights in innovation, uh, innovation especially in relation to vaccine. Public health law issues came, internationally public health law has been regulated by WHO, especially the international health regulation. So they had to look at how the public health was being looked after, because WHO primarily deals with the public health issues. And then we had the issue of human rights, human rights in the sense of when the outbreak of pandemic happens, spreads from country to country, the existing divisions and the differences in that country get uh, magnified. For example, those who were not living in good houses became more vulnerable. And because they were not living in good houses, they were dwelling on the footpath, they had more chances of spreading the disease. So the violations of rights Secondly, available access and affordability of medicines or healthcare became an issue uh, in population which was on the fringes. Which are these population? In India, we had a very interesting case of migrants, whereas abroad we had the case of refugees. I mean, just the erstwhile recent refugee crisis from the Middle East coming to the shores of Europe created so many vulnerabilities. And uh, they were not governed by the healthcare provisions because healthcare was meant for the regular nationals and citizens. So, in that case, they had to liberalize their healthcare provisions for the refugees. And then we had organizations which are dealing with this. For example, UNDP was dealing with, uh, I mean, as somebody said, issues related to dispute settlement in commercial area. Uh, UNDP was dealing with uh, uh, holding such meetings and committees. Regional organizations like European Union were grappling with the problems of 27 member nations. We had WHO looking at public health issue. But some of these organizations had regulations which lacked teeth. They had regulation, but those regulations were not strictly binding. So we will take the case study of IHR, which is the most relevant regulation at the international level, showing how these regulations came from specialized agencies of United Nations organization, but yet they lacked teeth. Who proved that they lacked teeth? Who removed their teeth? Or who did not get uh, bitten by the teeth? China. So you will see that now when we are discussing. So international health regulation, which was uh, uh, recently amended in, two th I mean, its recent version was created in 2005. Look at the year 2005. By about 2003, we had MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. We had SARS, the South Asian Respiratory Syndrome. We had Ebola outbreak. Then we had these uh, H1N1. We had uh, the um, Zika virus. So there were many outbreaks, which were pandemics, which were happening. So in the light of that, they amended the 2005. Uh, I mean, under the National Health Regulation, and in 2005, they created a new version. However, that regulation was quite capable of regulating the situation till then, until 
it confronted with COVID-19. So what was so unique about COVID-19, which challenged this regulation is what we have to see in terms of international law. So international health regulation has got a wider object and that objective is stated in uh, article. It is to prevent, protect, control and provide regarding the international spread of, of uh, disease which has a likelihood of being a, a public health emergency of international concern. P-H-E-I-C is the key word there. Public health emergency of international concern. Within 24 hours, binding obligation on the state, members failing to do so, question uh, uh, to be resolved. Soft mechanisms are very soft mechanisms, as I'll show you. How these should be resolved, the state must consent, etc., are mentioned in this regulation. I'll get into the detailed analysis of the regulation. Uh, now let us look at this international health regulation. Now, number one, aim, as I told you already, to protect, to prevent, to control, provide public health response to the international spread of disease. Secondly, to establish a single code of procedure and practice for routine public health measures. Otherwise, what happens? It's not a standardized effect. country will give some other kind of management by that time disease would be spread and many people will die therefore there had to be a standardized disease management protocol uh, in america they have standardized it because they had learned their bitter lesson by the outbreak of flu long long ago in the 18th century uh, i mean at that time you know it's very interesting at that time uh, you can see on youtube there are documentaries and videos i can share some of them with you where they are showing how the doctor uh, was seeing this outbreak in a particular locality in New York, only to find that the garbage was uh, accumulate, accumulated uh, in that particular locality. So the first uh, initiative they took was to clean the garbage. Um, outbreak of flu associated with the unhygienic water and garbage disposal was also linked especially to water. I mean, there was a hand pump uh, which was associated with this uh, spread of uh, cholera, for example. In pandemic, how they act, you know, spread of cholera. That was detected by a doctor in uh, England, in the city of London. So we all have all these Western Dr. cities. Dr. John Snow, ma'am. Dr. John Snow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. So these, these are showing that what we see in the West today is a byproduct of such experiences where doctors would have involved, the local committees would have involved. So there were interlinkages of environment and health. So today our concern when we look at international law from the COVID point of view, we are also looking at international health law and international environmental law because disposal of these materials and usage of these materials and outbreak of pandemic has very much a linkage with the way we manage the environment. So there had to be a single code of procedures and practices instead of routine public health measure when there is an outbreak of disease which is internationally spreading. So that is why we have the IHR coming into force. Now, what are the uh, major uh, changes they created in IHR? Because first IHR was created in 1961. How did they change it? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide is the one which showed uh, what I told you, the objective in the language of the IHR. The slide after that, please. Next slide, please. This was discussed already. This is the C single code and preventing, protecting, controlling, providing public health response to the international spread of disease than the routine approach. Next slide, please. So what are the major changes in the 2005 version? I gave you the background. To report major events that may constitute public health emergency of international concern. Who should report? Wherever an outbreak of disease, any disease which is contagious has a chance of being carried internationally very soon these days with globalization and international air travel. So uh, this is something that uh, seems to have been ignored in the new circumstances. 
then that country uh, should be uh, notifying it notifying to who to the who and then national core capacity should be there who keeps building these capacities i have been teaching public health law course to the public health uh, uh, major masters in uh, health uh, and medical sciences department and there it's very clear what are the capabilities how do you build these capacities what are the competencies required what is the way in which manpower should be organized skill should be imparted it's all very clearly laid out by who uh, even in case of mental health in case of disability in case of other kind of neural disorders etc so national capacity building building should be there and then real time event management system should be there so it's a management approach along with the norm approach along with the law approach which is seen here this is what in this uh, interaction with the uh, uh, philip sands the former uh, legal advisor legal counsel of who mentioned that time has come to create a better jurisprudence more jurisprudence around ihr as the basic norm and also to have a very strong management approach problem solving approach within the who so let's go next uh, to the slide please so if you come to article 1 article 1 talks about public health emergency of international concern uh, is defined as an extraordinary event which is determined uh, as per the regulation so there are certain conditions given in the regulation two conditions one is it should pose a risk public health risk to other nations through the international spread of disease means it should be so highly contagious it should be so dangerous as well for the community that it's very difficult to regulate it also secondly it requires it requires a coordinated international response so this is how PHEIC is defined one potential to spread internationally and posing public health risk secondly requires a coordinated international approach just close your eyes and recall the way in which the entire covid-19 situation unfolded from the beginning it had a public health risk uh, let us say at least from the time we started uh, getting to know from the media from the european side because uh, the moment it spread to europe we and uh, iran the media became very alert and uh, the media started carrying these stories and being closer to home in india these stories started coming in but uh, even though china is our neighbor and europeans are far removed from there americans are far removed from there we did not get to know what was going on how many people died uh, how contagious it was how highly contagious it was how dangerous it was um, nobody knew so if you uh, look at public health risk potential international spread required requiring internationally coordinated response none of us had an inkling of this till about uh, march first week you know so we will come to that the chronology let's go to the next slide i hope all of you are taking it in article 1 very serious and then we have article 2 i mean annexure 2 of the instrument which says the procedure for this which is contained in a separate annexure in that annexure look at the figures you know that uh, first of all it should be highly contagious as you see the way the kids are wearing the mask that is indicating that it is something that needs that could be affecting the respiratory system that means it is highly dangerous and secondly that it can be carried through aeroplane means by international travel and thirdly that mask coding could make more people to be you know vulnerable therefore you have to be uh, very careful uh, than the routine queuing up for public health needs so uh, in such cases how did the disease break out how did it spread what is the magnitude of the spread what is the time duration which was taken what measures were taken and how it was responding all these have to be documented and reported to the who the whole chronology of events have to be notified to the who which will again review it and see if it is phic let's go to the next slide now uh, to notify to who there are certain conditions or criteria to be fulfilled so the sketch shows the process on the left hand side you will see the criteria what are the criteria one of you if you can uh, uh, take it in one is 
uh, is the impact serious? So the mask itself shows that it seems to be serious because it is causing damage to the breath. Second, is it unusual or unexpected? Just recall the stories. Uh, different versions went around. However, there was a very clear evidence pointing it to uh, fast spread of the disease. Is there any significant risk of international spread? Of course, when it is in a city which is international, in a country which is internationally frequented, where the nationals are frequenting internationally being a big, big population and migrant by nature. Four, is there a significant risk of international restrictions to travel and trade? Of course, significant risk. Because which country is not associated with China? with the businesses, with the manufacturing, I mean, a large percentage of world's manufacturing is located there. Large population of the world is dependent on the goods produced there. Many leading manufacturers have their spare parts assembled there or produced there. And then uh, trade, it has become a kind of trade hub, though not in a dominant position, but definitely in a very uh, deeply connected way. And then associated travel. So this is the situation. Therefore, is an event notifiable to WHO under IHR? Is it qualifying to be PHEIC? Yes, if you go by what happened. So just ask these questions as we move with the IHR key parts. Now, they say that to identify it, you have to have the core capacity. What kind of capacity to detect it, to report it, and to respond it? to risks in general and to those at international ports, airports, and land crossings. If you look at the city of Wuhan, uh, where the outbreak happened, and the adjacent areas of Hong Kong, Shanghai, and then you come to Asian Tigers and all these places, highly networked, and then Beijing. Uh, so definitely, uh, uh, countries should have the capacity to detect it, to report it, and to respond to it. So what are the capacities? The capacity is again mentioned in Article 1. I have given you the copy of this. Core capacity for surveillance and response. You should be able to monitor it and respond to it. And then core capacity also to deal with it, to respond in a uh, different way. So next slide was, next slide. Core capacity requirements. Do you see the slides there? You have to know uh, how to detect it how to report it and how to respond to it and how to respond to the risks. India had done some trial and error as well. Even Italy did that. Many countries did that because the spread, the spread and the way the bodies were uh, falling, it was very difficult to measure the situation and have a very calculated response. Next slide, please. So, IHR clearly says the capacity should be at three levels. One is at the local community level. Second is uh, at the public health response level, which is the uh, uh, Ministry of Health response. And then thirdly, at the national level. In India, if you see, it should be local community at the district and taluka level. Then the intermediary is the state level. And then we have the national level. In all these three levels, this capacity to detect to report and to deal with or respond to the risks is very much required. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the kind of capacity that WHO expects in countries. If you look at the national level, they should have the capacity to assess and notify all urgent events within 48 hours. So WHO should have been informed within 24 hours if it had the potential to be public health uh, emergency of international concern for a country which has got so much of international interactions and trade. You, can you believe that China did not have the capacity to report? Uh, though uh, Here, uh, national IHR focal point should be there. And that national IHR focal point is the one which reports it to the WTO, uh, sorry, WHO within 24 hours. And within 48 hours of occurrence of the event, they should have assessed it. That means when the first person got sick and there was an outbreak observed, which usually happens in case of COVID, we saw first case happened and within seven days, we had hundreds of cases. And China also is no less in population. So the possibility could have been of reporting after the first case being reported 
within three days to WHO. So how many days did it take? We will talk about it. So every country has got a national focal point of IHR, even India has got in Delhi and other places. And then we have the controlling measures to providing support to provide direct operational link, etc., in terms of capacity under this regulation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so national IHR focal points not so important, but then Article 4 of the regulation deals with that. Each state will designate it, make it accessible to WHO. So there is a direct link between WHO and its national IHR focal point. Uh, and these focal points connect to the ministry, to the councils, and then they try to see that there is a standardized, uniform uh, approach and protocols. So uh, it shall uh, designate these points which are accessible at all times, at all times. So this is how WHO functions. Uh, the impression we are given is WHO is useless and the media is very uh, loose in its commenting. So that also as law uh, professors and law students, you have to be uh, taking it with a pinch of salt because first you have to understand what are the powers, what are the functions, what are the duties, what are the capacities and uh, what are the constraints and challenges they have. So what are the challenges they have? You can imagine by now what kind of challenge WHO had. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, WHO will also provide international assistance with the, uh, its network partners, its outbreak alert uh, and response network. Then you may be asking a question within your mind, what happened to such outbreak alert in case of China? So WHO will closely confidentially uh, observe the affected member state, verify and assess risks and how to organize the response. Thus, it provides a support. And then it also gives global outbreak alert. Uh, next slide. And uh, through the network of networks, it will provide this. So there are 120 institutions and networks which pool resources to do this. And then there is a rapid assistance provided for identifying, verifying, communicating. So uh, there, is, uh, there are so many strategies to be responsive and prepared at the global level to such outbreak. So this is how IHR system is organized. I am very sure all of you must be wondering what happened then. So why is this the classic case of failure of international norm? Because we anyway are looking at international law with the skepticism. And is this law operating in a vacuum? Are all the states uh, like citizens who have a kind of social contract with the United Nations or WHO to follow the law? Can we be believe states to behave like individuals because states are sovereign? So sovereignty challenge, autonomy, sovereignty means what? Self-determining, supremely powerful. That's what the word means. So. Can we compare it to the situation of municipal law where the citizens will fall in line and follow the norm? These are the questions which come into our mind in the context of COVID. Let's go to the next slide. If you look at the IHR time frame, uh, it was revised and adopted in 2005. And then in 2007, it came into force and 194 state parties are bound by it. And uh, because of this, a lot of core capacity building and competency building it is ongoing in the member states. So this is where we stand in terms of international law in the COVID context. Now let's look at the operation of them. What are the key issues, challenges and lessons that COVID-19 brought in terms of understanding the reality of international law, its background, its context, and its actual operation. We all know that COVID-19 was testing the multinational system and the United Nations. Uh, so based on what we discussed so far, you all will agree with the proposition that it did test the multilateral system and the uh, efficacy or the claims of uh, efficacy of United Nations organization, especially its specialized agency, the WHO. Uh, even in case of environmental law, we have seen different behaviors of states. Uh, we all know how Paris Accord was very difficult to be signed with the unanimity. Um, when it comes to the question of intergenerational equity, 
uh, sacrificing uh, for the collective good of nations or collective good of uh, the country, individuals within the country also, there is so much of uh, divergence of opinion. So between nations, this divergence of opinion is further exemplified. For example, reducing carbon emissions is something that United States of America will not agree because the pollution rates within the states is far higher than the pollution rates in any developing country because a family will own four cars instead of one car or instead of two families out of 10 families, one family having a car in India. So this is how you see the emissions are high. Agreement on uh, reducing emissions was difficult to be coming about. However, if you look at the COVID situation, COVID situation forced people to go on biking, uh, going off their cars, traveling was prevented. So because of this, uh, it is said that planet got a short breathing space. However, it was not a very happy space. It was a forced breathing space. So there was 5%, 5.5% reduction in the uh, greenhouse gases uh, emissions level. Uh, and uh, that was a positive of the short term, short term gain. But in the long term, COVID impact is negative because uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it impacted people in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, national economies, we'll come to that. So what we see here is the connect between one of the authors, one of the professors of environmental law from the Wellington University of New Zealand says that the connect between environment and people has been lost. So that connect, whether it could be brought back because of COVID is the issue. Secondly, environmental law has got, COVID has brought out how environmental law has got the new challenge of zoonotic uh, viruses. Viruses which are coming from the animal origin, from the wild. So the way we have, uh, the way human-animal interaction has been, the way trading in animal has been, the way the consumer behavior has been, the way the agricultural sciences is, or animal husbandry is. So there may be new curriculum created because of this new scientific courses coming up, new scientific discoveries coming up in order to contain this zoonotic challenges to environment, human environment. Uh, so uh, should, should we prevent zoonotic viruses or learn to live with it? Uh, uh, learn to not to disturb their natural habitat and bring them so that they can jump species and mutate. Because of our way of interfering with the nature in terms of uh, uh, being ecocentric means not to disturb the balance of the environment which is inherently there in environment. An ecocentric thinking will put the environment in the center. Whereas an anthropocentric thinking will put the human being in center. If you relish exotic meat, you bring those exotic animals, put them in the wet market, and then the escape, then the virus may escape and it may cause, uh, it may jump species and it may enter the human system. This was supposed to have happened in case of H1N1, then in the bird fever, and now uh, COVID seems to be, I mean, it is apparently, uh, it is the reason. Maybe they might have later on experimented with it and mutated it as some sources claim. Nobody has verified these sources. Some Japanese scientists are also arguing. Some American scientists are arguing. Anyway, till a proper inquiry is done, we don't know. But wet market and related viral outbreak has been there in the past, which shows that our own uh, ecocentric, lack of ecocentric thinking and zoonotic uh, uh, challenges being created by our own behavior and our own trading pattern, consumer pattern, food pattern, and food safety negligence uh, is something that we need to see. Internationally, some guidelines have to be issued because somebody in some part of the world ate it. Uh, we know that there is a principle in international law that people have permanent sovereignty over natural resources. But the natural resources are also common heritage of humankind. You interfere with common heritage of humankind, the, the danger that is leashed, unleashed because of that is a danger to the entire humankind. That's what we learned in COVID-19. Millions of people dying across the world, unprecedented, uh, unimagined a few months ago. Therefore, this is the new challenge that is going to come. And there are other challenges which are going to be thrown about. So this is the challenge which has come because of the interference with the environment. Uh, we, we might have a 
similar disaster resulting from climate change. Climate change suddenly resulting in uh, uh, what we call as uh, uh, water shortage, resulting in uh, pollution, breathlessness, uh, and thereby uh, the progeny getting affected. So if you want to give better air, better resources to the progeny, next generation, and thereby protect their health, then the environmental law needs to more and more uh, negotiate ecocentric interests in the place of anthropocentric approach. So this is one issue. Let's go to the next. I think the slide hasn't moved with me. Next slide. Yeah, this is the one. If you can take a look at it. Uh, this has been the real testing of the multilateral system. And one example is the environmental law where the states have behaved differently. They are not willing to sacrifice their, uh, their pleasure, their uh, love of exotic meat, or their love of uh, uh, too many vehicles, etc. So the, so the countries uh, as negotiating for such uh, interests are uh, not putting environment in the center. So it may throw up new health and climate change challenge. And COVID-19 has been uh, allegedly from a zoonotic virus. Zoonotic viruses have affected in the past also, the viruses coming through animals and birds, etc. So this is where our lifestyle, our consumerism need to be reviewed. Next slide. We continue the issue. In the COVID-19, China was accused of being non-transparent. It never provided the information. It delayed the information. So New Zealand raised an issue. The Prime Minister of New Zealand said that Security Council should be blamed for not taking action. Uh, everybody observed that this is the biggest, most important challenge after World War II. There was no challenge which affected the world as much as COVID-19. If you look at the Gulf War also, it was a kind of localized war. Although major powers were involved, it had some impact. It didn't have this kind of a telling impact all the countries going off economic production for one month, two months, three months, and the backlash falling for six months, you know, and all other human activity being disrupted. If you're looking at European Union, and if you're looking at human rights, United Nations human rights list also, a lot of rights have been affected. If you look at the right of children, look at children's three important rights, right to entertainment, right to uh, empowerment or development, right to education, the three E's in case of children who are the project. In case of us also, our general right to movement, right to assembly, right to freedom of speech and expression, so many rights were affected. I think uh, since your whole FTP is focused on COVID-19, many other uh, legal dimensions would have been discussed with you, they would have touched upon it, but I'm telling you, as, as a whole, whether you are a dictatorial country or you are an aristocratically uh, ruled country or you are a democratic country, the freedoms have been affected unprecedented in an unprecedented way. Therefore, this is identified as the important challenge after the Second World War. If you are looking at uh, uh, UN system in this context from the international law context, the specialized agency, which is WHO in this context, very important one, it has the core mandate to respond to public health challenges and outbreak of pandemic like this. So it has to work in conjunction with other intergovernmental organizations, uh, which is UNDP, which is WTO. So all these other organizations, I mean, IATA, because international air travel, I began with that slide or it could be also International Civil Aviation Organization. So IATA, because you have to regulate the price, otherwise uh, airlines may take unfair advantage of the emergency. Civil Aviation, because whether the aviation should be operational or not, between different uh, airports also needs to be sorted out. Maritime Organization, because there has to be supply of uh, goods through the maritime means and how do you land in the port and reach the goods to these countries? So there you, and then tariffs uh, and the trade, etc. So we had the IHR's rule-based surveillance, but uh, we also had the challenge of states not giving up their sovereign territory. Therefore, uh, the best practices of states 
I mean, we have a states like United States of America, which has a very strong uh, communicable disease control center, CDC, which has got a whole lot of training mechanism, law, ethics, guidelines, etc. Equivalent to that, NHS, National Health Services in England also had expert body, but not as robust as uh, United States of America. We had various other directorates across the world. In India, we had an Indian Council for Medical Research, which is now controlling it along with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and his health ministry. Problem with India is that uh, sometimes all three look in three different directions, although the sanctity of medical expertise is uh, upheld many a times. Uh, now with our nationalistic government, the alternative health practices are also emphasized. So a lot of times they engage in this war of uh, don't believe homeopathy, it is not clinically tried, Ayurvedic is not clinically proven, don't get misled, etc, etc. So all these discourses you might have heard of. So states have their own best practice in terms of collecting data, in terms of approaches to disease control and management, uh, sharing information and readiness to implement recommendation under IHR. And also to take action and capacity building. Now, January to March, when the global, global pandemic was going on, uh, what we saw was there, was there was no information cooperation or there was no coordination, January to March. Each one was uh, acting according to their capacity to handle the disease. For example, the country like uh, Italy, let's go to the next uh, slide please. A country like Italy, which is having the most rich uh, health insurance system and public health system, was the one which received the biggest backlash because of the large chunk of senior population and the way in which they manage the dead, uh, the way in which their old age homes were infested with dead bodies without proper cremation. Um, so those are the stories which shook the conscience of the world. Uh, so that's what we saw. So there were varied responses, national best practices, either two were of no use because IHR was not followed with the anticipation of a pandemic of this magnitude. So this is the issue, this is the challenge that world faced. And then we have the inherent issue in uh, international law itself. All of you know that General Assembly uh, can have the power to take global action, but uh, uh, it was General Assembly which set the past to two resolutions in the month of April. One was to ensure a global action with the coordination between countries because the gap of IHR and inability of WHO was tackled at the General Assembly forum. Secondly, it said that there should be uniform medical access across the world. Now, but then you all know the uh, those of you, you who are teaching international law would agree with me and uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with the United Nations Charter also that there is, uh, it is a plenary body. Uh, that means its uh, resolutions are having recommendatory effect. Although some of its resolutions have become the law later on like permanent sovereignty of people over the natural resources has resulted in proper natural resources management. It has resulted in compensation mechanism and evolution of the environmental jurisprudence, evolution of land acquisition law, uh, you know. Secondly, decolonization, uh, colonial removing of the colonies has happened because of that. So there has been effectiveness, but then in a disease control like situation, crisis situation, this becomes a principle to be followed rather than I mean, it has a norms, a primitive norm. It's a, a twilight stage of the norm. To make it a norm, it takes more action. Secondly, Security Council resolutions were passed in case of Ebola. They were passed in case of SARS. Uh, but uh, in that case also, uh, Security Council resolutions, you all know, is very effective. But in this case, if Security Council has to sue, or if Security Council has to conduct a kind of resolution, it has to do it on China, it has to do it on France, uh, or it has to do it on uh, some other powerful country which has not bothered to follow the norms because Sweden followed in a certain way, Germany followed in a certain way, uh, Brazil refused to follow. So uh, uh, what we see here is if 
anyone is blaming china and they are looking at bringing china to the forum of security council it's like bringing america to the forum of security council for the nicaragua case why because china is a permanent member of the security council and you know that permanent member has a veto power so this is one secondly the question of can china be sued can you sue some state if you sue okay america has got alien tort claim law america can sue a foreigner who is affecting american domestic interest or an american who has gone out and affected uh, any human rights or any other law that america has in uh, force within america so both is possible an alien can come and sue also uh, alien can be sued also but is that the case how will you effect uh, i mean bring it into effect is the question another thing is to sue anyone you have to have an independent body which has conducted inquiry and there has to be a fact who did the fact finding exercise what are the facts so internationally under the who's ihr regulation which i have given you you go through it under its articles the dispute resolution mechanism that has to be resorted to is the pacific settlement of dispute you can go for arbitration now in the meanwhile we had other issues like international trade dimension which michel zang of uh, again wellington university talks about she says that who looked at uh, threat to public health as a special situation so it put into effect uh, with its uh, 150 member countries three group measures to facilitate and expedite uh, essential transportation which is food and medicine and uh, ppe private uh, protective equipments uh, for uh, disease uh, control and risk control eliminating uh, special uh, trans border duties and removing special measures export restrictions to be removed compatibility issues to be ignored and collection uh, of commitment collectively there was commitment on the part of these member states there were also bilateral uh, trade declarations between new zealand and uh, singapore regarding combating the covid uh, therefore special trade measures of this type which i mentioned then uh, uh, there was also talk about deal with the decline of uh, global economy because they foresee a decline which will be as bad as maybe worse than 2008 because of the uncertainty and uh, outcome Uh, therefore uh, there was also concern because there was rapid rise and there was decline and again rapid rise they call it as a second wave third wave so in that case shortage of medicines shortage of ppes so uh, economic recovery on the one hand and uh, dealing with the crisis on the other hand both were to be visualized therefore wto looked at these measures in case of medicine exports to give online certificate and clearance uh, especially in the least developed regions next slide next slide is dealing with that yeah so do you get that this is what michel zang says let's go to the slide after that quickly so uh, global health law and policy if you look at it from this point of view after all our discussion so far is there an international institutional rule and the rule which is there is it seamless is it very well integrated secondly or are they islands what we are seeing is they are behaving like islands there is no seamless integration unless there is bilateral relay understanding or regional understanding like in europe uh, is there a challenge to multilateralism which is the classic feature of international law already there are challenges in case of investment with bilateral investment treaties so what do you learn about multilateralism in the covid crisis context in international law what we didn't do well what could have been done well what went wrong this is what professor philip sands uh, questioned the former legal counsel of who gian luca bursi who said some of the points which i highlighted that there is a lack of coordination let's go to the next slide yeah this is the one so how multilateralism is being challenged let's go to the next slide so if you look at the background and chronology of uh, covid-19 uh, we had the background of ihr which was first created in 1961 then we had the 2005 which we which i discussed with you already and i have given you the text uh, it can deal with any health health crisis which includes nuclear accident terrorist action and 
it has the mandate of detecting it quickly as i told you and to alert the world look at this covid 19 china alerts on 31st december and all of us believe that it uh, had the outbreak only by about mid december and on 31st december china alerts mm -hmm. but if you go back to reports and if you see the rumors of such deaths in taiwan and other areas had started in november itself and it was told that one level would have happened why beijing uh, didn't have any patients at that stage or is beijing having the outbreak now nobody knows china will not reveal because it uh, fears that its trade will be affected so article 6 says there is an obligation to report which i dealt with already if certain criteria are satisfied we saw the criteria and uh, uh, there is a there is a duty to provide data information finding and create isolation zones let's go to the next uh, slide now uh, china knew in november they say that smoke gun uh, evidence there is no smoke to be seen only because china will close either uh, close your eyes or they will cover the smoke so china's control on evidence because of you know how they had structured it they had done away with google first they had introduced chinese language driven domestic internet i mean today i had to do the meeting because the chinese were there i had to go on uh, microsoft because uh, uh, they do not take any zoom they do not take any google so this is how it goes so there was a uh, uh, who mechanism to go with the suspicion without internet there was no hint so duty of the state china's online media was so powerful that there was information blockade let's go to the next slide who's own web can it put information if it has got a network there because china is a permanent member of the security council and uh, human to human transmission news who went on denying and now we know that there is community spread in india as well so there is a design problem within this regulation which needs to be dealt with that's what the legal experts say and uh, in case of problems of international concern to expect the states to report and then to act is too late it should have its own mechanism and article 12 gives the power to the dg director general to determine now that power uh, once the director general determines not determining so much he has to determine as a consensus and if the consensus doesn't come about he has to go to what we call as uh, emergency committee next slide please and uh, you uh, in such case of extraordinary situation there was public health uh, uh, risk and uh, we see in the regulation very loose terms uh, if you compare the earlier cases of chemical spill in the river spill in the river or any other environmental crisis or thereafter our ebola and other things uh, to anyone if you compare what we see here is between end of december and 22nd january no consensus that it was emergency there was consensus not coming forth that's why we all got alerted in march when the bodies started falling in iran and uh, italy and spain emergency committee is an advisory committee dg is not bound by that unless dg takes a call it cannot be called as phiec now this is where the flaw is and then the flight blocking and then getting iata and all happened much later lockdowns etc happened much later let's go to the next slide by then countries were taking their own measure there was no consensus built across the world so even though there was undeniable evidence of community spread within a week the action was very slow and uh, the chinese uh, head meeting the who head was a spectacle but uh, what was the political realism uh there rather than the health emergency is something that all of us will be wondering about within a few weeks if that emergency was being declared and dealt with that would have been very very crucial in preventing many deaths and the long term impact on the economy and people and international trade let's go to the next slide uh so if you look at taiwan and singapore they got away with very handful cases because they were very very alert and they took national measures they were small countries as well to manage so uh, they were very quick in preparing on the other hand trump is still blaming the who and withdrew funds from that uh, so this is where i mean even international movement of goods posts for example all these were taken into consideration 
and uh, relative international norms. But all that happened much later and countries had very, very varied response. For example, France allowed its kids to school and kids started falling ill, but uh, there is no report of huge adversity. Let's go to the next slide. Now, uh, what we uh, saw was states were autocratically dictating it or the air travels were discussing that they will stop the flights and it was not the government's in consensus. Therefore, here we see a huge challenge to international norms. IHR as an international norm is seen as a soft law. It is a soft law. It lacks tooth and there was no Security Council resolution coming about. Therefore, this is a case, according to international law experts, which needs to be reviewed. There is a need for an overhaul of international law and reform of international law because even human rights dimension is missing within this law regarding personal freedom risk assessment. For example, in our own country, the power that the police wielded, how much of power? Is police power without any kind of restriction? So the courts had to come every now and then. Then knee-jerk reaction, for example, for certain nationals, we close the borders. For certain states, Maharashtrian cannot go to Karnataka. Maharashtrian, Tamilian are seen, people from Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra are seen as problematic. So if you go by the international human rights norm, this kind of unreasonable restriction without necessary expert opinion backing it and uncoordinated unilateral approach. What we experienced in India is typical of what the countries across the world experienced globally. So, uh, you know, we had the case of uh, a ship which was destined to uh, some other country being diverted to United States of America, uh, the ship which was uh, having a load of masks. Similarly, forcing India to sell hydrochloroquine is another issue. So this is, uh, this kind of holding of materials was also seen. I mean, they are blaming individuals for holding, chopping, but then countries also were not lagging behind. So such behaviors, whether they could have been tackled at international level. Quickly, next slide, because we are running out of time and finishing by 10 minutes. Uh, so going forward, what is the solution? One is, as we already told you, consultative mechanism, uh, which is politically effective, where states do the risk assessment through WHO with the experts. Then flights, instead of being allowed freely, because at that time they allowed, that's why people who came from Dubai, from Qatar, which are the maximum meeting points from China and other countries carried a lot of this uh, outbreak of uh, pandemic across other countries. So staggering the flights, testing, as I showed you the multicolor map, which showed how countries differed in their approach. Uh, India, Taiwan, Hong Kong were the few which were uh, alert in the beginning only. Uh, there were, uh, there had to be necessary barriers. Uh, countries did not uh, suspend air travel. India was quite fast in that. Taiwan was fast. Let's go to the next slide. So, what we understand here is uh, even human rights, for example, the balance between group right, individual well-being, vulnerability. Uh, uh, we had the migrant crisis. Then uh, the way we use the apps, we had the situation in Pune of some app showing somebody's name and photograph uh, of the patient, which you are not supposed to show, especially with the privacy law being enforced. Then regarding innovation also, early warnings being taken seriously to deploy vaccine discovery and a lot of things being sourced to Google, which seems to determine when the school should open rather than schools taking the decision. So information control in international protocols is another issue that you see where your lives are being controlled with the data. Let's go to the next one. Um, the other legal issues that you see is the global health law and governance, especially in vaccine uh, distribution. And uh, we have also had, uh, we have also had uh, in innovation policy alliance. Canada has mooted it. International uh, trade alliance and scientific solidarity uh, now there is a new slogan which is coming of vaccine nationalism. Whether uh, vaccine should be available to own country first and then only it should be sold outside um, or there should be vaccine once it is accepted, uh, clinically tried, it should be distributed equitably between countries uh, based on the patient distribution. So there is going to be not only war on masks, there is going to be problems in vaccine as well now. So United, uh, one of the suggestions is that United Nations should have a panel. Uh, actually, in uh, European Union, 
there have been uh, these uh, debates going on and in european union they have looked at it how covid has affected rule of law fundamental rights so there is a, there is there needs to be now for future very very credible planning very credible uh, needs analysis it has to be politically realistic and uh, price control of pharma coordination in trade and travel uh, connection to animal health food and agriculture interface between human health and animal health and zoonotic uh, threats and the most important one i'll tell you next slide please yeah uh, fake news for example the fake news is the one which exacerbated migrant crisis in india and uh, data privacy then uh, healthcare uh, including uh, prisoners refugees avoiding discrimination looking at vulnerable groups and media management i don't say media control but media management means uh, when the news comes allowing proper debates and uh, you know the way the whatsapp was becoming a university and uh, inform parallel information center than the official uh, tested information center was another thing you know, because lockdown exacerbated it access to information was restricted and functioning of the parliament and judiciary in uh, regulating such excesses of power and emergency and exceptional powers in india we underwent that under the disaster management act and pandemic act which is reflective of how we have to remind the nations with the consolidated coordinated reviews happening uh, between nations as well in a very consultative fashion and collaborative fashion not in a dominant fashion so this is how covid management through international law could be more humanized more in protection of democracy more into equality and more into Uh, what we call as uh, internationalism than nationalism and parochialism let's go to the next slide uh, future vision for ihr would be it has to improve its weaknesses it has to see it legally rather than politically expedient and there has to be a mechanism of alert compliance assessment and monitoring managerial uh, approach to identify the gaps this is what uh, who's ex council said so who effectiveness uh, could be better now it's not a sanctioning body but it should be backed by general assembly and secretary council action this is what is going to be the best approach for future now let's go to the next slide that's the last slide um uh, what we have to see is what uh, professor sand said greater coordination and cooperation proper economic direction and we have to go beyond nationalist moment i said uh, vaccine nationalism for example there has to be a proper inquiry what happened proper fact find who should do the fact finding no doctors uh, and uh, no uh, lawyers also it has to be people with the uh, exemplary uh, integrity and also with the multiple expertise there could be a lawyer there could be a doctor there could be an international relations or diplomacy expert but uh, those who have in capable integrity and the report and based on that action could be taken by united nations organization backed by a security council resolution but that will happen if security council will keep its permanent members at bay that cannot be imagined under the current charter of the united nations organization where there is a special veto power let's go to the next slide so what we are uh, hoping for is a change in the world order next slide yeah yeah this is all about the future so we need a solemn uh, legal and political principles uh, next slide we need an early action this is about references previous slide please we need a very early action a proper insurance mechanism i mean this is what we saw in europe insurance did not have a clause in india also it's happening a lot of media reports are coming about about insurance denied to such cases and also exorbitant charges by the health uh, hospitals and pharmacy so how far has who intervened in these or has seen that national regulations are effective by monitoring mechanism and uh, working on these reports and asking explanation so somebody said that withdrawal of funds from who lancet editor said it's a crime against humanity but uh, sand said that lancet editor is a doctor and he doesn't understand lawyers understanding of crimes against humanity because for us it is under icc that it is defined but nonetheless without proper funding who cannot function so making who function better is very important and if you next uh, what we want to say is 
if you want international law to be effective then you have to look at international law by creating more jurisprudence by making ihr more impactful uh, moving from simply consultation and toothless existence to becoming more consultative and coordinated and cooperative so that's the conclusion if you have any questions you are welcome uh, and the reference list is provided for your benefit now already in the chat line we have some questions very very interesting the reflections have come uh, vishal ranawri says international organization need funds to achieve objectives states are contributing recently who has not taken cognizance of china's mishandling what's your opinion my opinion as i explained to you the structure of international law who's own legality of being a consultative specialized agency with very limited mandate it cannot be blamed it can put up a report it can put up a recommendation it does not have i mean as of now it doesn't have the wherewithal to even to intervene if a state doesn't report because we never had such experience in the past for future the strengthening i have told maybe you raised the question before i came to the conclusion then uh, ujwala ma'am is asking how do you look at the role played by major political players like usa india and china during the pandemic did it affect the yes as i told you politicization of the approach was the problem and who also gets caught in that politicization because it doesn't have the legal uh, tooth to act or create sanction or withdraw certain facility moreover countries like us and china are permanent members of the united nations organization therefore this has to work as a citizens consensus and as a global public opinion than being bound up with state sovereignty and identity as the welfare of the humanity rather than welfare of chinese or american or indian can china be held liable under transmitter principle very good question shubhangi uh, now whether it can be held liable to make anyone liable first your facts have to be collected and those facts have to be collected in a proper fact finding mechanism by objective mode so in the united nations all the actions that have been taken in case of because who now as of now the law provides for uh, non judicial kind of uh, approach to resolve conflict therefore here if you are going that way then you will have to do the fact finding first there has to be an inquiry deeper inquiry to be done twinkle is asking a question thank you for uh, such informative session what according to you would have been the best approach to tackle this problem globally i said early preparedness early intervention and proper coordination between states not varied approaches the multi colored map is not the solution uh, security council and who were at fault it more than fault finding it is about what were the gaps in the law we didn't have a jurisprudence to guide us we don't have a case law or case study which is guiding us as a research as lawyers or as managerial uh, advisory we don't have anything to it therefore there is a need for developing such jurisprudence developing such studies and research that's the job of scholars like you thank you so these are the questions that i can see in the chat box if anybody else from the host team or anybody wants to uh, ask any question you're welcome i have overshot by about 25 minutes i'm sorry thank you for the session ma'am uh, i request all the participants you can also raise your hand and we will uh, give you the right to talk to ma'am directly if you have any questions thank you uh, we'll just wait for 30 seconds if you have a hand raised otherwise we'll proceed ma'am i think you've covered everything very nicely so i thank don't you. think i don't think there should be any hand raises i just gathered these from various scholars legal scholars who were responding to the phenomenon i have done lot of webinars on domestic uh, issues like for example most of the issues i raised were within the human rights dimension and it was also about the way in which the state has handled public health law dimension so here i confined to your uh, requisite uh, title of international law because that's what rutupriya told me uh, i was thinking of focusing more on human rights but then looking at uh, european union canada and others we took other issues like innovation trade environment actually ma'am i am the core issue 90% focus is on ihr ihr please see that is the current constitution for handling this thing or guideline we have nothing else yeah actually ma'am the session was very interesting for me also because i am a graduate of indian institute of forest management and, yeah and you gave a lot of references to uh, the environment and the uh, 
uh, miscoordination between, between environment and people. And we've all studied uh, the Dr. John Snow case when we were studying at IISM and uh, the cholera outbreak, how he was able to, you know, find one single hand pump because of which cholera outbreak was uh, uh, seen in London in the yeah. 50s, I guess, early 1850s. Yeah. So it uh, brought me back to those days of my life where, you know, we used to study all those things. Thank you so much, ma'am. I don't think uh, we, do, we have any further hand raises. So now I request uh, my colleague with ma'am's due permission to propose a vote of thanks, uh, Professor Shankla Swaroop. Thank you. Thank you all. Ma'am, uh, Shankla, uh, Shankla you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, ma'am, and uh, good evening to all our panelists, organizing committee, and the participants who have gathered here today for the National Faculty Development Program. And it is indeed my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks for one of the most informative and engaging sessions, which was taken by Professor Dr. Sashikala Gopal. Uh, on behalf of Prestige Institute of Management and Research, Department of Law, I would like to thank you for joining us today, ma'am. I would also like to add that the kind of knowledge and experiences you have shared with us today will definitely help us in understanding the broader aspects of international law, and especially during the, uh, during the times of COVID crisis. And I would also further like to thank Dr. Nishan Joshi in charge Department of Law for his constant effort and support in organizing this faculty development program. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Gopal Kak and Professor Sayali Bandi, along with my co-moderators, Professor Nakul Singh Chauhan and Professor Ritu Priya Gurtu. Thank you all of us for joining. Uh, thank you all, all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you once again, ma'am. I'll be ending the meeting now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Uh, please send me the recording if you have, okay? Uh, and feedback if any. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma ma we'll, we'll send you a YouTube link. It will be available yeah. on that. Yeah, all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.